I'm Margaret Effernan. I'm a professor of practice here at the University of Bath School of Management. I've led five businesses, that's the practice part, and I write books and articles about how business works or sometimes how it doesn't work. I'm really delighted to be here today with three really amazing people. All of them have had unusual and intriguing careers in finance. All of them, huge supporters of women, and all want to see women in finance thrive together. In the UK, the number of women in finance is rising, but that's from a very low base. The very volatility in the sector makes it hard to get accurate numbers. While the big banking institutions have been measuring gender equality for a long time, new kinds of firms from venture capital to private equity to digital finance to cryptocurrency are really hard to pin down. In terms of those approved to work in finance by the Financial Conduct Authority, only about 17% of individuals are female. And that number has scarcely changed since 2005. This despite a mountain of evidence that diversity improves decision-making, that it makes companies more reflective and connected to the markets that they serve, and some evidence that shows women generate better returns. Progress is slow. But rather than gnash our teeth and wail, which is something I've been doing for at least 20 years now, what I want us to do today, because I think it might be significantly more productive, is to explore where are the opportunities, the really interesting opportunities for women in finance. After all, there is a very great deal more to the financial services sector than just the famous bits, which are trading, mergers and acquisitions and accounting. So where is the really interesting work to be found? Are there advantages to being female? And if so, where, what might those be? And what is it that really helps women make it to positions of influence and power? So my first guest today is Jane Ellis Brush, who, as far as I can tell, frankly, is afraid of nothing. She started her career in construction, a male dominated field, if there ever was one. Not content with that, she moved into supply chain and spent the last 10 years working in Citibank as a managing director. We are phenomenally lucky that she's now come back to us at the University of Bath as a senior lecturer in information decisions and operations. So Jane, welcome. Hi, Margaret. Um, Rather brutal first question. What do you think has made you so fearless? When we talked about your career, you didn't strike me as someone who felt deep levels of timidity. Um, I've always been uh, regarded as very tenacious. Um, I don't really um, quit when, when I find things tough. Um, that being said, you know, I've not always found it easy in, in the career I've had, but um, I kind of find um, being told I can't do something makes me stronger. Yes. Um, and, I, and I'm quite obstinate about that. So it's been all the way through my career. I just I just am dogmatic and I push um, and I ask why not. And it, and it seems to work for me. Um, it doesn't mean I'm always confident, but I'm, I'm good at, um, I guess, portraying that. Uh, I think that's really important to, to sort of, um, you know, give a good impression, uh, look good and feel good. So it's probably one of my mantras. Right. And so what led you to start in construction? Well, um, it was just an opportunity came up. I'd already been working in supply chain for some time um, and the role came up as a supply chain director of a UK construction company. Um, and I hadn't tried that sector and I'd worked in a few other sectors beforehand and um, it was probably my first very senior level role um, looking after um, a large construction organization across the UK and many different um, different regions and different different organizations. So it, there'd been a lots of mergers. There was a diverse team. Um, I had to start from scratch building capability. Um, and I, you know, I really enjoyed it. And it was also the company was growing. So it was a very exciting company to be in. Um, it was, uh, you know, different every day, practically. And it was just about learning by doing, really. Um, I even managed the fleets of vehicles for, for a period of time on my own. So <laughs> You know, I got my hands dirty. Yeah. But I think you made a point, which I think is really interesting, which is, you know, the role was starting from scratch. And one of the things I found in myself and in the careers of many women that I've talked to is that entering a new role often gives you a lot more scope to shape it for yourself 
than walking into a role that has typically been done by men. Would you agree? Yeah, I do think that's, I mean, that seems to be a common uh, factor for me. A lot of the time is a lot of the roles I've come into have had a lot of transformation within them. I've, I don't think I've ever taken a role on where there hasn't been transformation as part of it, um, mm -hmm. which does give you the opportunity to, to create the scope and be flexible. And I think you need to be creative. You need to push. Uh, you don't don't wait to be asked would be my, my thing. You know, come up with a strategy, come up with some ideas. Um, and be really creative about it. And people are normally really excited if you're offering to do things and offering to be helpful, which, you know, I've always put my hand up for extra work. I've quite often taken on double roles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've offered to double hat. I treble hat, treble hatted in my last job. So um, it's something that I like doing. I'm full of energy. The more I do, the more energy I get, I think. So, yeah, yeah. But it's also great if you enter a role where nobody can say, oh, we don't do that job that way. You know, if there's a blank sheet of paper, it's really up to you to design what it is and how it gets done. Yeah. And I think even if you're in a role that's been there for a while, you know, there are ways of um, making it uh, better, you know, ways of improving it, making it more efficient, uh, you know, finding efficiencies and actually also delegating a lot of work, you know, giving right. it to people to, to help them progress as well. I think that's important to make sure other people shine. Yeah. So then why the shift to financial services? Um, got headhunted. Uh, it seemed like a really good job. I hadn't been in financial services. Um, it was an area that I didn't think I was going to enjoy. Um, I had visions of lots of male investment bankers and I probably they would be the last people I wanted to talk to. So, uh, but saying that I, you know, I joined uh, City and found it was an amazing organization. I worked in Europe, Middle East and Africa. So my team were very diverse. I had like uh, 200 people across 55 countries. So Wow. It, it meant, you know, it was actually really interesting for me to sort of work with a team. I did extensive travel, um, you know, came up with a whole new load of strategies. Um, so, you know, I started from there and then progressed to doing a lot more stuff as time went on. Right. I think people often forget that inside financial services is a whole complex series of operations that need to work well and they need to work fast. You know, so much of this has undergone so much transformation, even in the last five years. How broad do you think that range of opportunities is now? Oh, I think the, um, the, the I guess the infrastructure that supports the, the banks are huge. So, you know, I was working in shared services. Uh, I was running a, a service centre in Budapest for quite a long time. So we had 2000 employees. Uh, there that I looked after and you know so really big significant back office functions you know the finance function procurement function accounts payable uh, all the client services stuff so massive massive potential for people to do operations and do some important I guess behind the scenes work but you know you still have to interface uh, with bankers you still have to get things signed off you know you, you're doing a lot of strategy um, so it's still very exciting uh, still lots of cut and thrust and, and lots of pressure yeah one of the things I was wondering is, you know, a lot of what you were doing, you were doing in your role at that time was, was really, as you said, you know, it's back office, it's infrastructure and so on. And this is in an industry where certainly all the notoriety and power seems to derive from deal making. Right? Mm -hmm. So how far do you think that kind of um, um, infrastructure work uh, how far is that a sort of second class activity according to uh, instead, you know, in, in relation to closing huge deals with gigantic upsides? Well, uh, you're certainly, I always felt a little bit like a second class citizen quite often. So, um, you know, whether people would take you seriously um, or not, but, you know, without those functions, you know, banks can't exist. And certainly, you know, with all the new regulations that came in, um, you know, we became more yeah. and more important. You know, it, it, it couldn't just do the deals without that massive infrastructure behind, without mm -hmm. the governance and the support. So, um, yeah, we might, it might not be very glamorous, um, but we were a, a necessary evil probably from their point of view and just, just made it work. So, yeah, it wasn't, I did definitely feel like a second class citizen sometimes. And certainly, uh, you know, I, I think I said to you, uh, I sometimes felt like I was there just to make the tea because I was quite often the only woman in the room and it, it would be a while to say, no, I'm not here to make the tea. I am actually representing my function here. So, you know, some of those were a bit of a challenging, those challenging attitudes mm. that you have to push against, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, also, it struck me, you know, that that a lot of your role is about saving money, whereas the financial services really worships the people who make the money. 
Yeah, and I joined at a time when uh, just the financial crisis had just happened and I was in charge of expense management as well for Europe, Middle East and Africa. So having to have conversations with senior people about, I do mind traveling uh, economy. Uh, you know, or, or no, I'm not going to pay for that lunch. Uh, you know, you're going to have to pay for that yourself or claim it through expenses. And by the way, there's a limit. Uh, I think that, you know, I wasn't always that popular in the early days because that was a real focus for the bank. Mm. So it was a difficult conversation to have. The other reputation, of course, that financial services often has is that you are really working 24-7 and if you want to have a life, forget about it. Is that well deserved? Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I think um, I'm not going to say it's not. I think um, there is more flexibility if you're doing back office, but you're still expected to be uh, on call. And, you know, if there's a conference call at 10 o'clock at night, you join it. And especially with an American bank where the head office is in an American bank, you I had to join conference calls at ridiculous times. And if I was traveling, I would uh, have calls with my team at three o'clock in the morning from the US to make sure that everything was working back in uh, Budapest. So it, it, it tended to be, you know, quite a lot of burning the candle at both ends. Um, but, you know, I, I enjoyed it and thrived on it at that time. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, clearly, even talking about it, it's clear how enthusiastic you were about it. So, so what is it that made it so exciting? Um, for me, it was the people, uh, you know, watching uh, teams being able to develop. You know, I'm very proud to say, and I, I got questioned for it a number of times. I had a large uh, contingent of uh, senior women in my team, uh, had very few men. Uh, I was told some, at one point it was slightly imbalanced and I should think about recruiting a few more men. But um, I had some great women working for me and, um, you know, they they have gone from strength to strength. And it was great to see people come up through the ranks and, and develop really well. So I, the people just uh, I just. Yeah, I love people and I really enjoyed working with people who wanted to do more and were willing to step up and, you know, do, do an extra mile to do, you know, to get something done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things you and I talked about that I thought was really interesting was, you know, how, how much effort you put into, you know, hiring, developing women and so on. And you're continuing to do that, even though you're no longer obviously in financial services, with your charity First Impressions. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. I mean, it came out of um, a rather embarrassing episode where all my clothes uh, from my Budapest apartment got delivered to my two bedroom rented flat that my husband and I had got in Bath and the clothes just kept coming in and um, I actually had nowhere to put them. And actually, from that point of view, decided it would, it would be a good idea to uh, give them to somebody else because I've always found that you know wearing um, you know particular outfits or particular garments make me feel good uh, make me feel confident and actually quite a lot of women don't ever get that opportunity it may not be a suit but it, they may not have access to the sort of workwear that enables them to just feel a little bit more confident um, almost we, we're trying to find the last mile I guess in terms of um, you know getting people into work who are in um, difficult situations so we've set up the charity and uh, we're looking for clients and we have quite a lot of um, organizations we're working with. We're currently collecting clothes. Um, we're sort of starting to help women um, and it's getting really exciting. It's, it's um, starting to get busy. I'm getting a lot of organizations who are interested. Uh, we're still lacking storage space. So if anyone on this call has, you know, a nice room they'd like me, they'd like to give me to offer me for first impressions, I'd be very grateful. But yeah, it's great. And, and it's nice to see, you know, even our first client was so happy that we've been able to help her and um you know she's she's gone on to do to start working in a job and she feels a lot better because of the clothes that we were able to give her so it's 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 a nice thing to be able to do yeah fantastic thank you, thank you. Uh, do please as you're listening uh feel free to enter questions in the q a box we will be coming to those um later in our session thanks jane i'm going to move now to ali kazimi um, Ali now runs his own advisory business, a kind of miniature PwC, he likes to call it. But before that, he's been all over financial services, starting in what was Coopers and Lybrand, uh, then moving to Deloitte's and then to Blackrock's, where he was head of tax. Ali is a huge champion of women, and he has a real understanding of what discrimination can look and feel like. When he joined a cohort of 800 students at Cooper and Lybrand, he said the chances of a non-Oxbridge graduate of Asian descent joining such a firm were virtually nil. And Ali, although we've had a, heard a great deal about how tough financial services were on women, it hasn't always been a particularly easy place for Asian men either, has it? 
No, it hasn't. Uh, but I think uh, I was talking to a, a friend of mine, uh, a black lady, and she was saying to me that, you know, there's the difference between black women find it much easier than black men mm -hmm. in corporate world. Uh, that's not the case with Asian men. Asian men have had it easy, but I think it's particularly difficult for Asian women. And, uh, you know, if one reads the, the press over the weekend, you know, it was quite interesting. This new label, which I hadn't come across, this idea that you can, you know, your Muslimness can keep you back. So, um, you know, I think there is a real genuine issue which is to do with diversity, particularly for Muslim women. And what you find is that uh, quite often, and this experience isn't anything new, I'm sure people around the table will agree with this, is, you know, it's that discounting yeah. that goes with it, where, you know, quite often you're either told it's imaginary or that it's okay, you know, uh, to be Islamophobic or, to, you know, best person for the job. Well, you know, what do you mean by that? What, 50% of the population can't do this work? So, you know, the, the excuses are there. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, we've just had it, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. Up until the Me Too movement, it was quite interesting before I came online, I was just looking, uh, you know, how many people, senior financial executives, had been removed for sexist behavior. Yeah. Would you believe up until the Me Too movement, there were none? Wow. And straight after that, you know, I was a, a, a partner at Deloitte. I mean, 10 partners, partners were essentially asked to part way with the firm because it became completely untenable. And, you know, I'm sure they probably went under, there were the lawyers came in, there were gag orders and things like that. And in the past, it was always easy for women to exit rather yeah. than the perpetrator. So I think there are some real genuine challenges. And, you know, I see it as an alliance, whether it's Black, uh, Asian, Muslims, or whoever you are, you know, red, orange, pink, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Discrimination is discrimination. And, you know, those of us who have felt, you know, left out, mm -hmm you're not asking for something over and above. Right. I don't, we don't want special favors. All that is being asked is treat us fairly. Yeah. Okay. And it's, it's, it's just simple, something as simple as that. When you don't get that, when you get the closed clubs and the networks, when they're systematically working against you. you know, so many times I hear about, oh, it's not systematic racism. Of course, it is systematic racism. <laughs> You know, so yeah, I'm really, really am passionate about it, and uh, it, it's it, it has been tough, but you know the fact that I did make it, you know, partnership in various mm -hmm. firms and things like that. To me, that's a signal that things have changed. Have they changed fast enough? No, and as I've just pointed out, I think sort of like there is a real challenge around Islamophobia generally. But particularly when it comes to women, Muslim women, um, you know, we talked about the discounting, but, you know, this idea that somehow there's Muslimness, so females are expected to be submissive, they do not have a voice, they don't have an opinion, but to just categorically just put a whole bunch of people in that, uh, label them fitting into that category, I think there's a real problem. It's really interesting. You remind me of a time I was running tech companies in the States and my company had been invested in um, by a very, uh, very successful investor. And he had probably a portfolio of about 40 companies. And of these, the CEOs, I was the only female CEO of the 40. And there was one black CEO and one gay CEO. And strangely enough, the three of us became great pals and we really bent over backwards to try to do business together because on some level, we felt we had a sort of similar experience, which was we were sort of outsiders at the table. And I think, you know, you make a really interesting point 
that there's an opportunity, and I think a really important opportunity for anyone who's had any experience of this kind of discrimination to make common cause with others, no matter which outgroup they belong to. And in some ways, you know, the more that happens, the better. I mean, it was interesting what Jane was saying, and I could so, you know, uh, see so much of it as applying to me as well, just for that same reason. And, you know, you asked about, you know, what keeps you going. And for a lot of the time, because it becomes ingrained, I would always be challenged, uh, sort of doubting myself. And yeah. you're going through this imposter syndrome. And one of the things that kept me going is because I always felt that I was flying the flag for other people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're almost an accidental hero. It's not because of you deserve to be there. I'm here, you know, but, you know, finding that motivation, especially when it does yeah. get tough, when you are being marginalized, when you do see the injustice, you know, you work and you have to work extra hard in order to, you know, all of that is, is tough, but you just sort of like saying is if I quit now, you know, I would have, you know, there's all these hopes and expectations that go with you. Yeah, yeah. And yet clearly quite a lot of, as it were, out groups, minorities flock to financial services because of course, an accounting qualification is a really objective source of validation, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I think there is, uh, once you do have the qualification, you can actually rely on it. Mm -hmm. um, but the profession is still very closed. Uh, so I, I completely agree with you that it, in some ways it disappears. The, the issue of your, you know, I was referring to an imposter uh, syndrome. If you're qualified, you're qualified. It doesn't matter whether, you, you know, whether you're male, female and so on. That issue of ability just goes away. Um, mm -hmm. But nonetheless, what I would say, the socialization processes, they are there and they do work against sort of like, uh, minority and gender sort of like along the lines. And some of this, I think I'm right in saying, you know, you experienced in terms of a sort of drinking culture, which for a Muslim must have been pretty uncomfortable. Yeah, but I mean, I wouldn't do it now. Um, we, I, we run a Sharia compliant firm now. But in the early days, I mean, just in order to be part of the crowd, I mean, uh, so many times I would just order tonic water so it looked like alcohol and <laughs> be sipping away at it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's part of the challenges is quite interesting. We had recently, you know, the English cricketer at Yorkshire Cricket Club. And, uh, you know, you just have to put up and so much, so, so many of the times I and mean, things that just wouldn't be said now were just part and parcel of it. I mean, it applies to me. I, I, you talk about the finance culture. I mean, things uh, being on the trading floor I and mean, the language that women were being subjected to, if they made it to the trading floor, uh, you know, it was only one step up from a building site, basically. Right, right. Which Jane can tell us all about, presumably. Right. Yeah. So as financial services have become more and more complex and there are different kinds of incarnations, has the rise of things like hedge funds and private equity made a difference, do you think? Are these kind of new sorts of businesses open to new sorts of ways of working? I, I sense that, absolutely. I think there is a, a greater degree of, you know, when you moved away from the large institutional businesses towards these more boutique type of settings, mm -hmm. it is allowing a greater expression. And I think there's a younger generation that's coming through who are just not, I mean, it is it is really impressive. Uh, recently, I'm, I'm not sure if you saw that article in Bloomberg about uh, BlackRock let go of one of the, this firm called Flow Traders. They basically said, you're not going to be, you know, uh, uh, part of our ETF product program any longer. And it was because something was said to a BlackRock employee that was basically not right. It's not to say that BlackRock hasn't had its own troubles. I mean, 2016, there were sexist sort of like, you know, claims systematically was investigated that bring in external counsel, but the point it's changing. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a voice, there is a strength, there is confidence, and it's really good to see that. 
And the more we talk about it, it's great. I mean, today's webinar is one such example. It's great that we're talking about this. Yeah, yeah. But it's also very interesting to see a kind of leader in the field like BlackRock taking these kinds of issues as seriously as they do, because that sends a signal through the industry as Absolutely. a whole, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 So with all those challenges which you experienced, what remains the allure of financial services for you? Oh, I, I, I'm a bit of a techie. So to me, uh, you know, people might think that tax is really boring, but actually if you do financial services tax, it is the most interesting thing because what happens is the actual subject matter, I mean, you talk about sort of like the emergence of uh, hedge funds, the private equity sector, the hedge funds are changing as well. So, you know, I was on a call just now earlier on in the day, we were talking about um, the, the cyber hedge funds. So mm -hmm. you basically go into, uh, uh, you know, invest in, um, uh, uh, in, you know, fintech companies and things like that. Right. Hedge funds have had, this, you know, they, they're basically going into shipping assets. So all sorts of like weird and wonderful things that are happening. So the subject matter, the widgets keep changing, right. but so does the tax on top of them. So it's a really quite, you can, it's very difficult to get bored basically. Right. Uh, it's like what Jane was saying, you know, sort of like, you know, in the past, people haven't always appreciated the back office, the advisors, but actually we play more and more important increasing role. Right. As the legislation, the regulations become more complex, there is a greater need. Yeah, and uh, and actually that's part of the liberation part point that you're talking about. Once you once you have the expertise, you know my the color and my having a strange sounding name doesn't really matter because if someone wants securities lending advice, they will come to you. Right, right. <laughs> Nevertheless, you did decide to break away and decide and to create your own firm. So, what led you to do that? I think it's, you know, that liberation whereby you do have the confidence having done this for so long, yeah. where you think, um, you know, I will use the financial services jargon, which is, uh, you know, you've done the beta. Now I'm searching for the alpha because mm -hmm. it was easy when you've got a big name like EY or Deloitte over your head. Of course, you're bound to win assignments. But now you're basically really testing the strength of the alpha, basically saying, do I really, can I stand on my own? Are people willing to sort of like commit because they see the expertise? So it's, it's thoroughly uh, satisfying. And importantly about the, some of the practices, the people side of things, it's that investment. Uh, uh, if you get a buzz, you don't want to be uh, inhibited by Uber structures. You want the freedom to be able to go and do things. And sometimes you do um, things which challenge industry norms. And it's right. great. It's terribly liberating. So I'm sure, Margaret, you will talk about your experiences as an entrepreneur. Well, I think, I mean, I think one of the great things, you know, that's so interesting about entrepreneurs is that, you know, the mythology around them is everybody's in it for the money or everybody's in it for the glory. But actually, the reality of it is people go into their own businesses really to see what they're made of. Absolutely. It's a fantastic kind of journey of discovery and unbelievably scary, unbelievably gratifying, and everything in between. Yeah, it's not for the money. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's that, you're absolutely right, it's the galvanizing. Yeah. It really, you've had X number of years where you work other people's ideas, and you sort of like saying is, you know, I think I've got something really useful to take to the world. And I think that's really, as you're saying, terribly gratifying. Yeah. And how will you know how good it is unless you give it a shot? Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you, Ali. And last but very much not least, it's my huge pleasure to introduce Johanna Barr. Johanna came here to the University of Bath determined to focus her learning on finance as much as humanly possible. She had a pretty good idea what she wanted to do. A placement at PwC, another one at Deutsche Bank, led to a position at Deutsche Bank in m and in corporate broking. In 2007, she read an, a job ad in the FT, right? Those were the days. And she says she sort of stumbled into private equity and into investor relations, roles that were fairly new 
in an industry that was really just coming into the limelight. Johanna, welcome. I wonder if we could kick off by talking about what private, actual, private equity actually is. I suspect a lot of people have heard about it. They'll almost certainly have opinions about it uh, without quite knowing necessarily what it is or what it does. So what is this magical world of PE? Thank you, Margaret, first of all, for having me. And uh, thank you to the fellow, fellow panelists for some interesting commentary already. So private equity, um, to, to, I'll try to keep it simple. Um, as an industry, uh, we um, buy companies, uh, privately, mostly privately held companies. Oftentimes, it could also be in the form of a uh, public to private uh, in across different sectors, across different sizes. Um, and we look to uh, grow those businesses under our ownership invest in them, grow earnings, make them more valuable. Uh, and you usually try to sell them after a period of four to five years uh, with a view of making a healthy gain for our underlying uh, stakeholders. Uh, sort of the return targets on for private equity are usually that we try to um, you double the money for our investors. So uh, if we invest $100 in a company, we hope to, to sell it for between two and to $250. So that's a simplified uh, model. In terms of the investor base, I think that's really important. Where does that money come from? Um, you might be surprised to hear that it might come from a lot of uh, the, the own pockets of listeners on this call, uh, because our investors are everything from uh, US state pension funds, uh, insurance companies, um, uh, you have sovereign wealth funds, so you're uh, potentially part of your uh, of pension if you're a teacher in the US or a firefighter in a US state might actually be invested in, uh, in private equity. Uh, and so uh, the stakeholder base is, is pretty wide. And so we it's deemed uh, a risk risk investment class, because a obviously the return profile is pretty uh, uh, highly targeted, but it also, uh, it's illiquid. So given we invest uh, money in companies for at least four to five years, if you invest in a private equity fund, you know that you can't just call up the next day if you need some cash and, and want your money back. So the money is, is pretty tied up uh, for a long period of time. And, and hence uh, it's an asset class that demands a certain risk premium and risk return premium uh, as a result of that. Right. And at Advent, your role is described as managing director and global co-head of limited partner services. Yes. But your jobs in investor relations, which in PE is a whole different job, really, than the role that, say, investor relations plays in large corporations. So what is really at the heart of the work that you do day after day? Sure. The, a private equity firm is a technical term for a private equity firm is also a general partner. Uh, the investors are limited partners because they have limited influence and limited liability in terms of their um, you know, involvement in the day-to-day -day business. They provide uh, you know, the, the funds and, and we have fiduciary duty to invest those in a, in a sensible way. Um, what my role day-to-day -day is, to, is to ensure uh, that our investor base is aware of what we do with their funds. Um, you know, we uh, give them regular updates around the companies we invest in, uh, give them updates around the valuation of the port underlying portfolio. Uh, they may want to know about, right now we're getting a lot of questions about inflation uh, and what, what are we seeing in the portfolio. Uh, we get a lot of questions about diversity, equity and inclusion, how we're managing that within, within Advent, how we're managing that across the portfolio. Uh, around the time of COVID, uh, we get a lot of questions about what percentage of the portfolio companies are affected by COVID, uh, what's the exposure in Asia initially, what are the knock-on effects uh, to various issues around the globe. So it's uh, investors just want to be held, be updated around what's happening uh, to their investment. Um, and that's kind of the main function. And then on a periodic basis, uh, usually between three, every three and five years, we would go back to investors to ask for a, a recommitment to a new fund that we're raising. It's worth saying that different to hedge funds, investors might commit, let's say, 100 million to us over a period of, of a fund cycle. 
uh, they don't wire us the 100 million on day one. It's a legal agreement. And that means that once every time we draw down the fund, we make new investments, we might send them a capital call notice for 10% of their commitment, which then gets wired, which then gets immediately invested into, into the company that we've lined up. So um, uh, that's kind of how the model works. And so uh, they, they need to be kept updated what we're doing. And obviously it's now interest to be as transparent as we can be with our investors because we'll be knocking on their door in three or four years time to ask for a recommitment to the strategy um, and, and to invest in, in new companies. Mm -hmm. And how far at Advent are you focused on investing in particular sectors or with a particular strategy in mind? Or yeah. how far is it simply a, a very broad portfolio? We're extremely sector focused, but we have a very large team. So, um, you know, we have over 200 investment professionals um, we, we cover five sectors. You could argue we have sort of five global sector funds uh, investing in parallel. Uh, we have anywhere between 30 and 40 people that are really dedicated to, to one sector. And that's kind of all they do. They wake up in the morning, try to find a, a good deal in the European tech space. And, and that's kind of their, uh, their main focus area. Um, from a, um, and I think the reason it's important these days to be extremely sector focused, and we're certainly not the only ones, is that to my initial comment about being able to grow a business and help them transform, maybe, you know, from a business that might just be on the east coast of the US, making them US wide, or a business that's just in UK, in the UK, and, and but has an offering that might be interested, interesting for, the, for continental Europe, uh, to be able to grow that, uh, you need really expertise in your sector. Um, and so the more expertise we can bring to the table and the more repeat knowledge we have from a, an old deal we might have done, uh, the more likely is that we, we create a successful outcome for the companies that we own. Right. Now, I know that PE gets a lot of negative press. It's often accused of asset stripping companies, piling them with debt. But I also know that isn't the whole story. There's a lot that PE can do, which other kinds of financial institutions really can't. Can you explain what you think really makes PE a kind of crucial part of the financial system? Yeah, I, I look for, for me, uh, private equity um, is ultimately, um, you know, there to to support businesses and and to uh, fulfill their growth potential. Um, and oftentimes, it can be something that. Um, is not possible for the uh, under current ownership. So that might be under current private ownership. It might be a founder that has taken it to a certain level, but there's now an investment required to take it to the next level. And also not just the investment in terms of dollars, but also in terms of expertise. Um, you've seen that over and over again, that you know founders can do an excellent job in taking it to a certain company size, but then struggle with topics like supply chain and, and scaling, um, which, uh, which is not, bad reflection on their capabilities is just a natural kind of point that's hit where, where they need further support. Um, there's also scenarios where in a public company setting, oftentimes, um, you know, we, we found that certain public companies um, might be underappreciated, uh, sort of lost a little bit in the FTSE 250 um, and maybe not covered as well by research analysts and misunderstood. And there are certain structural changes that need to occur and some of those structural changes, to be fair, are easy, more easily done or can be more easily done outside of the public uh, limelight and outside of having to report to your shareholders every, every quarter. And so um, I think that's where private equity can, can add as well. And then finally, I would argue that the, the governance model of private equity is, is the strongest, uh, one of the strongest out there. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we hold you know, management teams and, and boards accountable uh, for, for what they're uh, doing. And, and uh, we've shown that, uh, you know, as an industry, we can affect change uh, in a pretty rapid way uh, and, and modernize businesses for, for kind of what's ahead. Right, right. So it's interesting because there's a sort of tension, isn't there, across financial services between the short term and the long term. And it always seems to me that PE is, is sort of sitting, sort of able to have a longer term strategy and able to use private capital and being private to develop some really competitive strengths. And yet the big new thing in private equity is all about going public. So going back to the public markets, 
So um, isn't that a little weird? You know, the, in the past, one of the great advantages was we could be longer term in our thinking and kind of dig in by being private. And now we're seeing IPOs of PE firms themselves. What's going on there? I think, Mama, there's an important distinction here. One is you're asking me about the private equity companies themselves and what is the right ownership model for them. The mm. other is the companies that private equity companies own and are in their portfolio and what's the right ownership model for that. And so I think those are very two distinct uh, points. If you're asking, you know, maybe I'm taking your second question, uh, uh, why are private equity firms themselves deciding to go public? Right. It's part of that same growth journey. Uh, a lot of them started out as, as private partnerships. A lot of them started out as, as maybe founder led. Uh, and, um, you know, those founders are coming uh, to an age or a point in their career where they need to think about succession and monetization, frankly. Right. And so to the extent that they uh, may be held uh, or holding uh, the ownership in these private equity firms quite closely, uh, the, the, sometimes the only way to, to monetize that or to you know, do their own succession and estate planning is right. to either sell part of the, uh, uh, the GP, the general partner, uh, to an outside shareholder and or to take the the general partner public and i think that's what you're uh, that's what you're seeing i think that doesn't change the underlying uh, nature of the private equity firms in that they will still invest in companies uh, in a fund structure uh, which um you know has is is more longer term focus but it does certainly add a certain tension uh in the industry between um kind of what the public markets value private equity as and and uh, the the public companies, the private equity companies that are currently public, uh, you could argue there is quite a focus by public shareholders on assets under management mm -hmm. versus uh, the the gain uh, or the carried interest that that private equity firms uh, realize and what value the they attribute to that uh, outperformance in terms of uh, on the on the deal level. So that's that's sort of the. Um, but that's again down to the public markets and how they value companies and how they value the private equity industry as a whole. Uh, and so you're seeing that dynamic play out. Yeah. And it's interesting because it feels like a sort of coming of age of the industry because so many people who really started the whole PE industry are now getting to a particular age, aren't they? Yeah. And particularly in North America, you're seeing many founders in the late 70s, 80s still around. And so there needs to be some orderly succession planning. And I think that's what you're seeing happening. Right. Yeah. Um, just one last question. I was very struck looking at um, the Advent website that there are a few more female faces on that website than I've seen in a lot of firms. Is that Advent or is PE generally, do you think, a good place for women to be? Look, I think the industry and financial services as a whole, I also want to end on a slightly more positive note. Uh, I know obviously Jane and Ali have had their experiences, but I've had nothing but positive experience as maybe, yeah, you know, slightly younger female in this industry, uh, starting out in, in investment banking uh, on, on the front line in mergers and acquisitions. So even there in a, in a sector, yes, that's still quite, it can be quite male dominated. I think I was, you know, always, um, welcome with open arms and, and I, frankly I think if, if as a woman you decide to go into financial services um, you will have every opportunity you, you take so I think I want to make that point in this forum as well uh, financial service sector as a whole really wants to uh, evolve wants, wants to see more women and as a result is also very flexible in the, in the career paths that they can offer and, and similar to Ali's comment I think from a a qualification perspective i think if you if you manage to to do um, a number of years in banking or in accounting whatever it might be uh, you set yourself up very strongly for anything else you want to do if it's then going off into private equity or venture capital or running your own business i think having a solid foundation uh, in finance i think is really important in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion uh, at advent or private equity or financial service more broadly it's at the top of everybody's agenda. What helps, I think, for Advent, we have um, we have a very a globally diverse group to start off with. Uh, it's a little bit with a common Jane made around uh, uh, working with colleagues from all nationalities. So, so that's always a good starting point when you have 50 plus nationalities represented. Right. 
Um, but then also from a from a female perspective, I think we do a relatively good job uh, on a you know on a on a global level. Actually, um, you know we have I think roughly 40 50 percent are female. That naturally takes everybody into account. If I just look at the the deal colleagues, deal team colleagues that uh, you know the ones that are finding the companies and trying to make investments, it's still right today as of today roughly 30 percent of our uh, colleagues are female. So on the gender side. We're, we're making good strides, but we're still way behind where the ambition should be, uh, like like uh, everybody. But I, we, we have a lot of um, uh, programs in place um, around, in particular, also sponsorship, which is different from mentorship. Uh, you're trying to bring uh, female talent uh, up the career ladder, uh, giving them opportunities at the entry level. Naturally, we try. Uh, at the minimum to, to start at 50 50 that's not always easy given we feed right. from, from other financial service sectors usually the way into private equity it's usually banking or um, consulting uh, but it can also be in smaller private equity firms accounting is oftentimes an, an entry sort of level qualification uh, but it's it's not it's not that easy to get to the 50 50 at entry but that's the the target and then the key though will also be the retention, because that's the other tricky thing as you start a family, uh, as you have other priorities, or if it's elderly parents, whatever it might be, um, that uh, that's obviously a topic that's important for everybody, not just our female colleagues. And that's where the I, th I do think the the culture overall is shifting. Uh, there's also a lot of young men in, in the team here who are starting to take uh, uh, you know, parental leave uh, and, and taking that uh, not just for a few weeks, but for, for a number of months. And so I actually am very positive that the young men in our organization are the ones who are going to drive the change as a result of them also wanting more flexibilities. And I think the women will naturally benefit from that. So uh, I see the whole topic a bit more positively maybe than, yeah. than the other. But also, I think that comes back to a sort of theme here, which is that actually in this men and women can and should be allies. Right. Yes, absolutely. Right. I want to come to a question which one of our um, participants has, or uh, one of our audience has posted, because I think it comes to this. And um, I will, I'll start with you first, Johanna, and then I'll come to Jane. The question comes from Helen Mace. How do you get the confidence to set boundaries as a female without the fear of being seen as not willing to be a team player or a hard worker? So given that, you know, this financial services is a pretty hard charging environment, how do you get the confidence to, 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 to put up and defend your own boundaries? I think you just have to be confident in your own abilities ultimately, right? I think if you go into a certain area, you probably go into it because you think you can do a good job and, and you'll get that feedback as part of your annual reviews if you're doing a good job. And, and I think then you, that confidence grows and sometimes, um, you know, if it comes to taking on another assignment, if, if you, it really overwhelms you, you, you need to say, look, I'm, I'm stretched. This is what I can do. This is what I can't do. Can you give me additional resource? I think just creating a, a, yeah, a level of, of confidence in yourself, being clear in your communication, uh, but also being a team player. I think it is, a, it is a, a very exciting industry. I think you're surrounded with a lot of very bright people, which is where you get your energy from. Right. Uh, and from that teamwork and, and working with a lot of smart colleagues. And so um, uh, I think having confidence in your own abilities to, to manage that and just going for it. And the same goes when you start having hopefully a family. And, and if, that's, if that's something uh, people, want, you know, sort of viewers on the line want to think about at some point, um, it, same goes there. If you, if you need to be at home at a certain point, you just leave on time. I, you know, just don't overthink it. Sometimes women overthink their careers. I think they already made, to, to decide at university not to do finance because they want to have a family and they think they can't combine a family of finance. But at that point, they still haven't even met their future husband. So my point is don't, don't overthink your life. Do one step at a time and at least give it a go. Yeah. Jane, what's your experience on this front? Yeah, I mean, I think you need to be upfront. If there if there are things that you need in order to do your job more effectively, then you know you need to be upfront and honest. But you know, I also think if you're stepping into a role, uh, never assume that the way someone's done it before is the way you're going to do it. So you know, I took on two other managing directors' roles and did three jobs for five years uh, and survived. 
And, and I did that because, you know, I, I found a good load of people to help me, delegated quite a lot and gave them opportunity and found an innovative way of supporting the function. So, you know, I, I think you, like, you know, like Joanna says, it's about being confident, having the confidence in your abilities and then putting your case forward if, it, if it's not working for you. Um, you know, I do, I do think, however, that women can struggle on the return to work. Um, especially if they're at a senior level. So I think, you know, that's one of the other challenges is, is about, you know, how are you going to make that work and what's important to you? So, you know, it's quite important to have those discussions up front early and don't just expect to, to come back um, to the same place you were if you haven't set that out initially. Although there's loads of rules and regulations around it, I think in reality, you've got to be realistic about how the organisation continues without you and what are you going to, how are you going to set it up for success while you're not there? And then when you come back, how's it going to work? So I think, um, you know, I've had very senior women working for me on maternity leave and they did such a good job delegating to their teams that when they came back, it was fine. They were able to just pick up where they left off and, the, and everything worked really well. So I think it, it can be planned for. Well, that dovetails very beautifully with another question that came from Linda Fletcher, who was very interested in your original comment about delegation. And um, she'd like to, show, to, to hear more about how you made sure you use this as a strategy. I'm sure there's a, you can probably tell me the quote somewhere more than I can, Margaret, but you know, it's something about a leader's job, uh, isn't the leader's job to make themselves redundant. At yes, the end of the day. Exactly. So, so the whole, uh, you know, my, my premise was always to, um, you know, give people a lot of the work I had to do. And because I ended up taking three managing director jobs on, I had no choice but to delegate. Um, and actually the team did such a great job at it you know I, I, I guess eventually they didn't need to to keep me as, as I was and that's partly why I've ended up sort of coming into a different world and portfolio career so you know for me I think it was a really great way of training people a really great way of giving them um, opportunity um, and it you know I think if you don't delegate properly then you can't bring your team up and you can't then you can't then step away so the people I delegated to you know, the most senior female is now doing my job and she's doing it brilliantly. Um, you know, and I put her in my succession plan and she got the job. So, you know, and equally someone else that I did the same to, she's now running another, organ another organization in the same group. So, you know, I think if you help people and you delegate properly, then it sets them up for success um, over time. And it's a responsibility really of leadership that, you know, you have to do that. Otherwise, you know, don't be surprised that people then leave and find something else to do if they don't have enough interesting stuff to take on. Exactly. I just have to ask you, because it strikes a chord with me when you say that you were doing three jobs, and I've definitely been in that situation myself. Were you getting three salaries? No, but I did manage no. to get quite a good salary increase on the basis of that. And my bosses were quite surprised I had the balls to ask for it, to be honest. Right. <laughs> I didn't get three salaries. I always thought I should have done because I saved them two salaries. Yeah. So actually, yeah, didn't work that way. No, it's funny. It's only looking back. I can see there were times in my life where I definitely was doing two jobs for the price of one. And I now think, why did I do that? And why did I actually not step forward and say, right, well, I'm doing this, which is a full time job and that that's a full time job. So how about you pay me for both of them? But um, we could all live our lives differently. if We looked back. Um, Ali, this point about delegation, how important is that, do you think, to a successful career? Thank you. I was just unmuting myself. Well, I mean, having gone through the whole consulting route, you know, you have different stages. So you come in, the early years are really about getting technically up to, you know, reaching a certain standard. Then the second phase of your career is really around managing teams. And the, the last stage is really around sort of like, you know, uh, going for partnership where you are becoming a leader of the business and that model would completely collapse so you won't be able to scale to that level unless you're able to de delegate so your ability to progress within consulting is completely dependent on increasing levels of delegation and that's what you go through and you know in many respects I'm sort of like Johanna mentioned that she's uh, you know gone into uh, private equity after having had these careers and that's exactly it whereby you go through your career pathway and at the last stages it's really you enjoy the reflected glory of the people and you know my job in my current role is all about um, letting others do the job and I just enjoy the, mm -hmm. the 
you know, um, the reflected glory. And other times you're just coaching people and telling them how to do things, imparting, uh, which is essentially sort of like, you know, my next 10, 15 years are all about exactly that. How do I build a legacy? And that's through other people because time is now limited. It's about the influence that you're, the leverage you're getting through other people. Yeah. Uh, whilst I, I'm here, can I just say something on the boundaries thing? Sure, please. Which is, uh, you know, it's a friend of mine. I had somebody who's on a trading floor. She contacted me, Asian background, and she was very, very upset because um, she's a VP at one of the US American investment banks. And uh, one of the chief traders had basically publicly shouted at her. So there are different types of boundaries. I know we've talked about work-life balance type of boundaries. Hmm. I mean, that was quite sort of like, so she was quite shaken by that and everybody on the floor observed it hmm. and nobody intervened. Hmm. And again, the, the, the sense was that being of an Asian background, it was completely acceptable and <clears throat> she just had to be submissive and live with it. And so she said, like, you know, what shall I do? Because it will be breaking you know, everybody was there. Nobody thought it was out of order, you know. And my suggestion was, look, this shouldn't be happening in what was, um, you know, two years ago, 2020. Um, this shouldn't be happening now. And you should absolutely go to HR, say what's happened, and just how upset you feel about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's due credit to, to her. She found that courage. And she went in. And later on, I asked, you know, how was it? Because what well, HR immediately, you know, you can imagine it's a US house. They're not going to let this one kind of thing pass away. So he was called in, HR was present, and she extracted an apology from him. And she said, when I was talking, she goes, I had to really hold back tears because I didn't want to let him know that I just, and she goes, my heart was just sort of like beating so fast. And she said, but I'm so pleased I did it. Mm. because I established that boundary. And I said, look, I, have, I respect you. You're my senior, but you will never, ever talk to me in that fashion. So I think those boundaries are so important yeah. because when, whether you're a minority yeah. or a female, you allow the boundaries to be crossed, right. you have left the door open. And I think it's fair to say we're living at a time where it's probably easier to assert that than it has been in the past. There's clearly a lot more to say on all these subjects, and I hope we can explore some of them in the next webinars that I'll be hosting through the year. Next month, I'll be addressing what the World Economic Forum has described as the single biggest and most urgent issue facing business today, sustainability, and getting to carbon net zero. Last week, I wrote for the Financial Times about the fact that in the UK, 57% of chief executives do not think they have significant carbon emissions. So there's clearly a big job to be done to bring business up to speed. I hope you can join me for that. In the meantime, thank you for joining us today. Thank you to our three wonderful panelists for sharing your work and your passion with us here today. Thank you so much and goodbye.